So we're going to turn, thank you all so much for coming and all your support and being here. Um, I think this webinar probably got uh, some of the most support um, of any of the ones that we've done. So, which is great because it's supporting charities and they really need our help at this time um, more than ever. So um, you're joining myself. I'm Cece. I am Brilliant Estate Planning. We've got um, Philip Lancaster here. Uh, who I'm never sure whether to call Phil or Philip, um, but anyways, <laughs> that's him. And then we've got Laura Forbes from Grace House. Um, so she's going to tell us a little bit about them. Um, and we're going to go into how you can support charities a little bit better during this time. So I'm just going to turn right over to Laura. Yep. So um, thanks for coming along this afternoon, everybody. Um, so who are Grace House. We are a children's charity based in Southwick in Sunderland. Um, we provide a range of support services to children with complex disabilities, health needs, and we support their families as well. And we cover families across the whole of the Northeast region. Um, so what does that what does that really mean? So we offer short breaks so children can come to us, they can spend a couple of nights here, um, they get a home away from home or a sort of holiday experience and um, families get a bit of respite as well, um, which is an amazing service. Um, we have remained open during lockdown, um, which is great. We've just reduced the numbers of children that we can have here at Great House. Um, so children can come in, they can enjoy the gardens, um, we've got huge gardens, we've got a vegetable plot, we've got a play area, we've got an internal garden and loads of space where you can get out and kick football and uh, have a water fight as well, which loads of the kids have been doing during the, the hot weather that we've been having. Um, we also support the family through a wide range of services. So we offer counselling services and that's for parents and carers, but also for um, disabled children and their siblings as well. So it really is a focus on the whole family that we support. Um, at the moment we are offering our parent and carers counselling via Zoom um, so we can still get involved with our, our families during COVID-19. Um, we can't really offer children's services at the moment via Zoom just because they are so interactive and because the play aspect of that is so important um, for, for the counselling sessions. Um, we run a wide range of activities so this is all sorts, some are fun, some are, have a, a more sort of serious reason behind them. So we offer mindfulness sessions for parents and carers. We have yoga classes, we do Zumba, journaling for well-being, and all of these sessions we're doing via Zoom at the moment as well. Um, and it just creates that sense of community with our families, which is really important. A lot of our families are suffering from um, isolation at the moment. And um, it's just really important to show them that they, they are still part of our family as well, um, which is great. We've also, during COVID-19, we've also created some activity packs, which we have delivered to families. So um, there are some photos on this slide of that. Um, so we created a pack where um, the families could grow their own sunflowers together. Um, and then they've been sending in photos of the sunflowers as they've been growing. Um, and again, it's that sense of community and, um, you know, being part of something else when you're stuck at home. Um, and we also created a, um, a Let's Play Together pack where we had the recipe for Play-Doh um, and the kids could do some messy play and then um, play with the, the Play-Doh that they've created. And it's just something a bit different that the families can do and then they can engage with us as well. Um, so we do have a, a, a wide range of services um, for, for families and we support families that are um, disabled children and that's any disability from autism right through to cerebral palsy and um, more um, conditions where you're maybe in a wheelchair and you've got no mobility and things like that. So, so we see a wide range of children through the doors um, and in a in a nutshell, that is, that's Great House. That's fab. Thanks so much, Laura. Uh, Laura has actually like helped me out specifically. I have a, my dear friend has a son who has um, like some complex needs and uh, she's been having a bit of a hard time because she's got him and, and a little girl at home. Um, 
and you know lockdown is hard on all of us it's definitely hard on kids um, and especially ones who need a little bit extra support in general anyways and although um, my friend doesn't really go to grace house or anything laura was able to put me in touch with some people who could help her who just very kindly spoke to me um, i passed on their information to her and then she was able to get in touch with them um, and she was able to talk to somebody who understood get some tips and ideas um, and things that really helps her a lot. Um, so they do loads there and I can vouch personally for them. <laughs> um, I think it's, um, so, sorry, Cece, just to say it's really important that you don't have to access all of our services. It's very much, you know, if all you need is um, to speak to someone who knows what you're going through, then that's, that's what we can, we can do. Um, and sometimes that's enough for people just yeah. to get them, get them back in that right frame of mind. Um, but if you do, need more support then obviously we offer that as well so yeah it's very bespoke depending on what you what you need yeah sometimes it's just nice to know you're not alone yeah well great so we're going to turn over to uh phil now um and he's going to tell us a little bit about how uh we can give to charity and gift aid and some other little tips and tricks so i'll, I'll go over to you now phil brilliant thank you very much so for those who I haven't spoken with before, um, I'm a financial advisor. And while I live and work in the Northeast predominantly, I do have clients that stretch all the way down to Kent and all the way up past Inverness. And for the last 10 years that I've worked in financial services, I've combined that kind of passion for finance and helping people achieve their goals with charities. So whether that's working in a firm, looking at the corporate <coughs> and social responsibility, or promoting charitable giving with my clients, or actually working directly with charities themselves in terms of cash management, or investing some of their endowment funds ethically, which is a, a growing area of uh, work that I do. So it might seem counterintuitive that someone who calls himself a wealth manager is talking about giving money away, but actually it works really well with a lot of my clients. And that's whether they're a young professional who can only give 20 pounds a month out of their disposable income, or someone who's kind of later in life and looking to leave a larger legacy. So it's something that I'm talking about a lot. And I also have a connection to Grace House in that my mum uh, actually volunteers there on a weekly basis, providing portage support as well. So I've heard firsthand about either facilities, but also the work that they do there. So if you have the next slide, please, Susie. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. You'll be happy to know that I've only got three slides, so you won't be flicking through too much. Yeah, I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> and one thing that I want to do is just give you some ideas. I'm not going to go through absolutely everything. As you can see there, there's loads of ways that we can give to charity. I'm just going to give you a few examples and hopefully it inspires some interest and any questions put them in the chat facility that would be great and we can cover those up at the end as well or maybe during the presentation so it's it's likely that we've all gifted to charity and the fact that you're on this call means that you are interested in charitable giving which is great and whether that's 50 pence in a cup in northumberland street or sponsoring friends and family in what seems to be increasingly ridiculous and daredevil activities just going and doing three peaks isn't enough. Now you have to do kind of a hundred peaks and do a bit of skydive at the end. And when we're, I was putting these slides together, if you're like me, one of the things that comes to your mind is not how you give. Every time that I give, I always wonder how much should I give? And I thought it would just be fun just to say that um, the way I do it is probably if it's on just giving, I look at who gave last. Hopefully it's not the parents because they always give loads. Hopefully it's another friend and use that as a benchmark. But that's not very scientific. So what I did was I went on Charities Aid Foundation website and they've actually done some research into this to say what's the average gift that people give. And they've got two measures. So the median gift, so basically they took all of the gifts, well, apparently they have all the gifts and ranked them from smallest to largest. The middle amount was £20, which I think is a pretty good benchmark. And I like to think uh, if I know the person, I'll probably give £20. But interestingly, they also then summed those gifts up and divided it by the number of gifts to give a mean. And actually, that's a lot more at £45. So it probably shows that at the tail end of that gifting spectrum, there's quite a lot of large gifts. So I'm going to talk about 
two things, two ideas. One is going to be giving now, and one's going to be talking about legacy. So on the next slide, what we can see is that 33% of people give via direct debit or standing order. So that's people giving to charity out of their tax income. And we've all probably heard about gift aid, and gift aid is something that we've all probably either done or thought that we should be doing. And I just wanted to explain a bit about this. It's very simply the ability for charities to claim back the basic rate of tax for gifts given. And to qualify, a donor simply has to be a UK taxpayer and to tick that box to say that they're happy for the charity to claim that basic rate of tax on their behalf. But as the slide says there at the bottom, gift aid's very misunderstood and people miss a huge opportunity because they either don't understand it or don't trust it. And I'll just give a short demonstration of the, the power of gift aid. So if you imagine I want to give 20 pounds a month is the average donation to Grace House, that would be 240 pounds a year. So what I have to do then is tick a gift aid box to allow Grace House to reclaim the basic rate of tax. So that's 20% or grossing up 25, which means that the actual total benefit that Grace House gets is 300 pounds. So I've given 240, Grace House gets 300, fantastic. What people don't know is that the assumption made there is that everyone's a basic rate taxpayer. If you're a higher rate taxpayer, so that's a big assumption, so let's assume I'm a higher rate taxpayer now, I can actually claim that additional 20% of tax back myself. And I do that simply by self-assessment. It's one of the boxes that's on your form if you're self-employed and do that already. So what happens is I either get a rebate or a reduction in my tax bill of £60. So the true cost to me is £180 and the true benefit to Grace House is £300. So this is massive and it shows where that £600 million of missed eligible donations is coming from if we multiply that on a large scale. So gift aid is fantastic. And if you think that's good, hopefully payroll giving will blow your mind. This is superb. And it's something that's gone out of fashion for one reason or another, which is a shame. And on the previous slide, it said that actually payroll giving only accounts for 2% of the gifts given in 2018. And that's despite workplaces like BT and even St. James's Place matching donations in some capacity that are given in this method. So we can look at payroll giving from two perspectives, one from the perspective of the employee who's giving and one from the employer, because there's important benefits for both. For the employee, the benefit is simplicity. There's no box ticking, there's no self-assessment forms that are required. What happens is that you get tax relief at source. So I put there again my 20 pounds a month donation. The actual cost to me is only 16 pounds and there's nothing else for me to do. For employers, there's actually multiple benefits and I've, I've listed a few. I think one of the things that's good about payroll giving is that it's, it's a good way to engage your employees, especially those firms that are nominating charities of the year. Like let's support Grace House, how should we do it? We'll give our time and we'll also give some funds. Payroll giving collectively allows you to give a large amount and engage all of your employees. Secondly, it's good for your corporate and social responsibility and the visibility of that. What you can actually do is you're allowed to use a national payroll giving excellence mark on your website or in any communications that you give. And all you have to do is put yourself forward for a national award as well. So it's a nice day out to an award ceremony and you get to talk to lots of other companies that are interested in payroll giving. And the third thing is often companies are worried about tax and actually will this have an impact on me financially? And the answer is no. What happens is the company still gets corporation tax relief on the gross amount that the employee gives. So it doesn't, to me, it doesn't sound like many downsides and lots of upsides from companies doing this. The biggest question I get is, well, how do we actually set this up? And it's the same whether you're a huge multinational or a very small one-man band who pays himself out of payroll giving. And all you have to do is go on HMRC's website and set up with an approved payroll giving agency. And there's loads on there. One thing to look out for is that some of them do charge admi administration fee, and that can vary. But there are a few that actually do it free of charge, and they're charities themselves. So there's one I think on there is Cooperative Payroll Giving Limited, that's worth looking at, and I believe that's free. But 
please do your own research and uh, let me know if you need any any help in that capacity. So that's giving now, and I think the reason I focused on this is because it has the most advantage from being aware of it and trying something different, and especially payroll giving. I think, as I said, it's fallen out of vogue, but it's something that I'd like to see come back into fashion a bit more and for people to start taking an interest in. The other method of giving that's not on that list that I had before is a kind of a legacy. And what I don't want to do is step on CC shoes too much, but one area of legacy uh, that I'm keen to promote is kind of pensions legacy. So if we can flip onto the next slide, CC. Brilliant. Legacy is something that's increasing massively in awareness and also popularity. You might have seen TV ads for some of the bigger uh, charities promoting this now. And the place where it really struck home for me was when I went and visited uh, America last year on holiday. While there, for some reason, I decided it would be great fun to go and visit all the colleges like Harvard and Yale. And I'd recommend it if you are there. And when you're on those tours, they often talk about kind of how they're funded. And the biggest way they're funded is through legacies. And actually the universities themselves can survive purely on the interest from these huge legacy donations that they're given over time. So they have some of the biggest funds in the world that they manage purely by these large donations. So for us as individuals, one of the biggest pots or potential legacies that we'll leave when we die is after our house is going to be pensions. And there's a key date to remember with pensions is age 75. If you die before age 75, you can pass on the full pension pot that you've accumulated to a beneficiary tax-free, which is massive. However, once you reach age 75 and over, there is a tax that's applied of 45% to any lump sum distributions made at that point. So the reason why I'm mentioning this and not CC is because a pension sits outside of your estate. It's already in trust. So what you need to do is to fill in a very simple form called an expression of wish to say on the event of death who you'd like your money to go to. And one thing you can do on there is nominate a charity. And that's really important because once you die dead, sorry, you can't change this. You have to nominate that charity before you die. The other caveat to this is that you can have no living dependents. So you have to survive your spouse and have no living dependents, which is tricky for a lot of us, but it does have a, a real significance for some people who might not know who they want to leave a legacy to, and especially this large pot, if they have no children or a spouse to leave that to, make sure that they've nominated a charity if that's where they want it to go to, and you can avoid that 45% lump sum tax if you are over the age of 75. So just wanted to, well, actually, we were all playing with this before when we found the poll function on uh, Zoom. So I thought it would be quite fun if uh, we could do a little poll on both elements. So there's a few questions for you there to complete, and we'll see where we all are. I do want to just say I've been uh, looking at the chat, and um, Alan was mentioning the cancellation of the Great North Run and the impact that that's having on charities. Um, and then Chris and Laura have come in and said there's a 30 million pound deficit for charities. Um, Grace House specifically, Laura said, uh, had 25 runners last year raising over 8,500 pounds. Um, and because they're not being able to host as many events this year, it's going to be really difficult to make that up. Yeah. And I think that's where these other methods of giving are going to have to try and replace that to some extent, especially runs and things are great for one-off donations but that regular giving gives the charity I don't know Laura's some comfort if you know that someone's set up a regular payment or you have a firm committing regular funds you can almost plan with that funds in mind for future years as well. Yeah I think what's um, really been highlighted with the um, pandemic is that um, maybe all of our eggs might have been in one basket um, mm. so we did a lot of um, fundraising in person and um, so we had our events throughout the year um, like the Great North Run it happens every year we get 25 runners we raise sort of the, the, the same amount every year roughly um, and then as soon as that's gone it's like well, well hold on we, we should have had other things in place as well and moving forward that's definitely something we're looking at is mixing in the, the digital fundraising with the in-person fundraising and other income streams as well. 
Yeah, I think it's just we all kind of need to think out of the box a little bit, um, different ways that we can give and support, different ways that you as a charity can fundraise. Um, and I think that's like kind of why we put this together is just to sort of say like, hey, there are some more things that you can do, even if you can't give right now, here's some stuff you can do in the future or little bits that you can do now. And if everybody just does a little bit, then it adds up to something really, really big um, and helps quite a bit. Cool. Are we able to share the poll then, Cece? Should we have a go? Oh yeah, have, oh, I thought you had done it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> There we go. Can everyone see that? And it's anonymous as well. So you don't, if you click no, there's no naming and shaming. <laughs> yeah, we won't call you out, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> um, Laura, there was a question. What do you think you'll do digital wise for fundraising once physical events are back? Yes, so I think the um, the key is we've started to introduce quite a few digital events now, online events. So um, we've got an online quiz that goes every week. We've done online bingo. We've done um, we've got virtual race nights going on, and I think it's just more of the same with that, um, and really embracing the sort of new technology that probably isn't new at all but we've never really embraced it as such um where you know you can link your strava up to your fundraising page and post videos to that and do virtual runs as opposed to actual runs where you gather with you know large amounts of people um and this way we can get um we can get more people involved from different areas as well. So, you know, we are seeing a lot of support from um, people further away than there has been. Um, so it's great to engage with, with other people on that one as well. So, yeah. Um, also had a question, is Grace House purely funded by donations? Yeah, so um, our short break service, it works in partnership with Sunderland Care and Support. So we do get some income from that. Um, and then it is fundraising and grants and trusts that fund the, the rest of it. We don't get anything from um, the government or anything like that. Okay. Um, so if you can see where, sh can y'all see the poll results? So you can see, okay. So 86% um, say they give regularly to charity. 57% um, don't know where their pension schemes are, which I think is pretty typical. I certainly have no clue. Um, have you completed an expression of which uh, wish form for each scheme provider? 71% um, say no and 29% say not sure. Not a single person has said yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's it's really good. I think in terms of regular giving, there's a stat saying 49%, so roughly half of people regularly give, which is great. So we're above the national average. And I think we're probably around the average for the pension schemes, those pots they might seem small at the moment but if they've got 30 years to grow they could be large amounts that you need to consider who's actually going to benefit from that and potentially it could be a charity yeah for those expression of wish forms are they just something that you know you can ask your provider to to do or should they be asking you if you if you want to do one or yeah, so you can literally log on, type in Nest Expression of Wish or Legal in General. It's usually a one or two page form that you complete, sign and send back to them via email and hold on to. It's really, really simple, but it's amazing how many people don't do that. So it just helps when you're administering an estate, which is probably a good segue for your section, Cece. Hey, yeah, <laughs> I do just want to, because I don't want to ignore anybody in the chat. Um, and Chris has come in and said he's a trustee for the Sunshine Fund, which is supported by the Evening Chronicle, and it's scary times. They've done a couple of digital events, but it's really hard because not everyone is used to webinars and online. Um, and it, well, Laura said, yeah, it takes a while to get people engaged and build up the numbers. And I think that's kind of the point is like we're, we're in this sort of transitional phase. Um, and it's probably going to be somewhat like this 
for a while. So it's sort of like getting used to kind of doing everything digitally in a different way. And so also trying to like to think differently about how we can support. So maybe if you're not like super into webinars, you could set up payroll giving. You know what I mean? There's sort of like different options that you have depending on what you do. But yeah, we, we appreciate that it's that it's scary times for charities and just <laughs> trying to do what we can spread the word. Yeah. Okay, fab. Well, I'm gonna take over now and share a little bit with with you guys about different things. Um, so uh, I'm CC, <laughs> as I said earlier. I'm a certified estate planner, and um, so I own Brilliant Estate Planning, and I do wills, trusts, and lasting powers of attorney. I am obviously not a Jordy I'm from North Carolina in the states. <laughs> I don't know if you could tell. Um, <laughs> by the accent. Um, I have lived here for, it'll be three years in September. Uh, I moved here to be with my husband. Uh, we got married and moved over here and he's actually Cornish. So, um, and we have an English bulldog. So it's just like a really weird, uh, mixed family, <laughs> but you know, we do what we can. Um, speaking of which that's Harley there in that photo. Um, she's, just looking cute as always. I'm absolutely obsessed with my dog and make no, no apologies about it. Um, and I'm passionate about helping people. Everything that I've ever done in my life, every job that I've ever had um, in finance, in management, um, in administrative roles, whatever it's been, uh, I just like working with people. I like helping people. Um, it's kind of like my, my calling in life, I would say. And uh, doing this sort of estate planning and starting my own business, doing that has really enabled me to help a lot of people. So what I want to talk about um, is just some different ways that you can give in regards to estate planning. So you can add a legacy to charity in your will. I'm sure a lot of you have probably heard of uh, legacies. Um, but you can basically leave either like a monetary amount or a percentage of your estate to uh, to a charity like Grace House or any other one that's that's close to your heart. You can just put that in your will, um, and then when you pass away, they'll get either that amount or percentage or whatever it is. Um, this works the same way if you're distributing your will to a trust. So if you kind of want that additional security. Uh, or any other reason that you might distribute your will to a trust, you can set, you can, well, do multiple trusts and you can have one trust that just goes out to the charity, or uh, you can just set the charity as a beneficiary of that trust the same way you would do in your will and say, okay, so I'm leaving everything to my spouse or my kids or my brother and sister or whoever, and also naming this charity like Grace House. Um, to receive 10% or 5% or 20% or whatever it is. Um, and another thing that I think is really interesting is you can donate property, you can donate art, um, all kinds of things. So I know like in the States, um, it's probably not here, <laughs> but in Carolina and Virginia, people, some people would donate like cars and boats and things. Um, there's one called like Boat Angels or something like that. I swear it's called something like that. And people like when they passed away or whatever would like donate their boats and stuff. But you can do things like that now. You can donate anything like an old Victorian wardrobe or something in your house that you know is like worth some money or whatever. You can donate things like that now. I know a lot of people have been going through their houses. I certainly have gone through my house. And I've got a pile of stuff in the garage to get rid of. But if you're gonna like sell it, then you can sell it and you can donate the money. You can donate the actual items to the charity and then they can either use them or sell them or whatever. Um, so that's a way that you could also give now, but you can also leave those things in your will and give later too. So, you know, if you have like an, an extra property or you have uh, like a car, a piece of furniture, a piece of jewelry, whatever, um, then you can name that in your will and you can give it when you pass away. Uh, so these are some common misconceptions. I really like to do these. I like to do like little myths and misconceptions and stuff. Um, oh, hang on. I got some stuff in the chat. <laughs> Give me a second. Uh, 
By leaving a legacy in your will, depending on the amount, it can also be a great help and tool to reduce the amount of inheritance tax. Yes, exactly. Um, I'm going <laughs> to talk about that in just a second. So uh, one of the big misconceptions is that you have to be wealthy to make a difference. And I actually looked up a statistic and less than 10% of multimillionaires in the UK is involved in philanthropy. And while that's a little bit scary and personally um, might not reflect uh, some of our values, um, it also means that all these charities that exist in the UK uh, that, are, that are thriving and helping people and doing all these things exist and they are being helped. So what that means is that regular people just like us are already the people who are helping these charities and are keeping things going. So, if we're already doing it, I think this just shows that we can just do it a little bit differently. And every little bit matters. And Laura's gonna talk a little bit more about that at the end, how uh, every little bit counts, but it really, really does. Kind of like what Phil was saying before, you know, you leave like 20 quid a month or something, that's, you know, that's 240 pounds a year. That's like more than nothing, right? <laughs> and if a couple of people do that, that's quite a bit. Uh, another misconception is that gifts get taxed. Uh, you can actually reduce your tax burden by gifting to charity, and there's no tax on land, property, or shares donated to charity. So Phil again talked about this a little bit uh, with like uh, pensions and shares and stuff like that. Um, but if you have like a really, if you're worried about inheritance tax and things like that, um, donating to charity can actually reduce your tax rate, and anything that you give to charity isn't taxed. Yeah, uh, so that's quite interesting to know as well. And uh, a last misconception that I wanna talk about is writing your will or changing it to leave a uh, legacy to charity is difficult and or time consuming. Uh, writing a will is quite straightforward and amending it is exactly the same. Uh, <laughs> something that I do a few times a week for clients at least. Um, and leaving a legacy to charity in your will is just like a clause that you have to write in. And I don't charge any extra to add that clause in. So um, sometimes there's sort of like extra fees for extra little things that um, have to be added into a standard will that don't come exactly standard. Um, but I don't charge anymore. Uh, if you wanna leave something in charity, I think that's great. I encourage you to do it. Um, you can also put, do all kinds of different things in your will. Like you can say, uh, instead of um, like flowers at your service, you can request donations to a certain charity. A lot of people do that. Um, you can do kind of like all sorts of different clever things in your will to not only for you to leave a legacy to them, but also for the people who care about you, uh, who want to kind of do something in your memory can donate to that charity as well. So like my mom passed away from motor neuron disease uh, almost 10 years ago, and we kind of did the same thing for her. So we uh, had always supported it done like the walks and things like that uh, for motor neuron disease. And it's called uh, ALS in the States and it's the ALS Association. Um, and they have a chapter that was like in our area. So when she passed away, instead of flowers and things like that, everybody donated um, to the ALS Association in that particular chapter uh, in her memory. And it was really lovely and great. So there's like different things that you can do like that. Um, so because I've talked a little bit about different things, I just wanna kind of like <laughs> go over what estate planning is and what I'm talking about. Uh, so just for those of you who, who want the information. Um, so a will is a document that states your final wishes. It's read by a court after you pass away. And then your executor that you've named in your will is responsible for making sure that your final wishes are carried out. Uh, you can distribute your will to a trust like I talked about before. Um, and like Phil has mentioned, there's all sorts of different types of trust. It's just a way to pass on money and other assets. Uh, it can minimize fees, um, reduce like hassle for people that you're leaving money to, and also again, create a legacy of charitable giving. So you can have a, a trust set up now that sort of like gives percentages and all sorts of different things. Phil is the one to talk to about that. Uh, he explained it to me and it absolutely blew my mind. <laughs> so if you're interested in that, please get in touch with Phil. Um, and then lasting powers of attorney are legal documents that let you appoint someone to make decisions on your behalf. That's if you lose capacity, 
um, or if you just allow them to. So like going back to the example with my mom having motor neuron disease, uh, she was like in her mid thirties when she got diagnosed. So obviously that's not something that you plan for or think is going to happen to you. Um, and we didn't have any planning in place. So I've experienced firsthand what it's like, um, when somebody close to you gets sick and you're not prepared and we had no will, certainly no trust, definitely no lasting powers of attorney and trying to do those things. Um, even things like, obviously she was aware of what's going on, but she couldn't hold a pen. So if she needed to sign a document, we had to like put the pen in her hand and then hold her hand and then sign for her. Little things like that that you don't necessarily think about and it can be really important, but there's two different kinds. So there's a property and financial um, and that can go along with actually what we're talking about as far as like charitable giving, because maybe um, like Phil was talking about with his mom, that there is a, um, that she works with Grace House every week. She volunteers for them. It's really important to her. And maybe if she wasn't able to volunteer for them anymore, maybe she would want to um, donate to them. So if she was in a situation where maybe she wasn't necessarily able to do that, then maybe Phil uh, had power of attorney for her and could sort of like give for her and continue that work on uh, with Grace House because that's something that she's really passionate about. Um, and then there's a health and welfare lasting power of attorney, which just allows whoever you appoint to make healthcare decisions for you. Um, because just because you're either married or um, have a long-term partner or just a partner in general or a sister who's really close to you or a parent or a child or whatever it is, doesn't mean that if anything happens to you, that person who would, would be able to make those decisions, um, including end of life decisions. Uh, <laughs> which can be quite scary to think about. And again, because I've experienced it, um, I'm just a real advocate for this kind of stuff because you just want to have it before you need it because by the time you need it, um, it's usually a little bit too late. So I have a poll too because I also am technical and fun. Um, <laughs> okay, so I'm going to launch this poll now if you want to answer that. Um, and I've got my uh, contact details up on the screen while you're doing that. So if you wanted to have a chat with me about anything that we've talked about, um, please do. Uh, all my contact information is on the screen and it's always 100% free to just have a chat. It's not gonna cost you anything. So if you have any questions about you or a family member or whatever the case may be, please just get in touch. I'm happy to talk to you about your situation, give you some information, give you a quote, some ideas of whatever you might need. Um, and then we can, we can kind of go from there. You can do whatever you want, <laughs> but I just want to help. I see that the poll results are coming in. I think it's like 10 seconds left. I think it just gives you like a minute. Here we go. So 71% um, of people say they have heard of legacies, 29 haven't. 71% knew that they could donate property and art, 29% didn't. Um, do you think that you need to leave a lot of money to make a difference to charity? 86% uh, of people said no. So that's great because you don't. <laughs> uh, do you think gifts to charity are taxed? 57% said no, 43% said yes. So that's like a, a pretty even margin there. I think a lot of times we do think about like taxes, like capital gains tax and stuff like that. So it's good to know that they're not. Um, do you think writing or changing your, will, changing your will to leave a legacy to charity is difficult or time consuming? 86% said no. Hopefully that's because I explained it before we did the poll. <laughs> um, and do you have a will with a legacy, legacy to charity in place? 14% uh, said yes, 86% said no. Um, so yeah, if that's something that you wanted to look at in your will or just write a will and think about putting a legacy in there, it doesn't have to be a lot. Like I said, it can be a monetary amount or a percentage, but it might just be something that you want to consider because it keeps a lot of charities going. Um, it is like really important to a lot of different charities and it can make a huge difference. So if there's someone that 
that you already give to now, um, if you want to learn a little bit more about Grace House, whatever the case may be, um, setting something like that up uh, can benefit like more than you could ever know. So uh, I just want to say thank you all for listening to me. And I'm going to pass back over to Laura, who's going to just give us a little bit more specific information about Grace House now that you've heard from me and Phil. So there you go, Laura. Mm, yeah, so it's just to follow on from what, what both CC and Phil said about kind of what does your support mean and how giving something little can turn into, into a lot. Um, so I'm not going to read through everything that's on the screen here, but if we look back at what Phil said earlier about donating £20 a month to then get £240 over the year, which with gift aid turns into £300 over the year, that's 10 counselling sessions for a disabled child or their sibling. So just to put that into context, you might, you might not notice it, that £20 a month might have been your coffees on the way to work over the month, you know. So, um, so when you kind of put it into context, you can see uh, how it really does make a difference and how the little things add up. Um, I, I've got a question. I haven't done a poll because apparently I'm not technical or fun. Um, <laughs> Um, but we have collection boxes as part of Grace House um, and they're out and about. So the collection boxes, you know, you, you stick your coppers in, five pences in. So if you just want to pop an answer into the chat, how much do you think those collection boxes raise over a year, roughly? Pop a figure into, <laughs> I like it, Chloe, a lot. <laughs> Good answer. Good answer. £600, £3,000, 5000 wow. 4,000, so there's quite a different 750 pounds. Cool, 3,600, that is very specific, Jamie. Um, 3,000, so interestingly, um, last year from our collection boxes, we raised 7,000 um, pounds, which is amazing. So I don't think anyone said 7,000, the highest was Nicola with 5,000. Um, and that, that just goes to show, you know, what a little does um, and you don't think about that. Um, and then seven, yes, gold star for Nicola, um, you get a virtual high five. <laughs> um, so, you know, you don't notice it and it really does add up. Um, and that £7,000 supports Grace House for a month. So, you know, it's, it's the lot of little things that, that add up. Um, yes, so anything that you can do to support Grace House does make a difference. Um, a lot of you said, you, you know, you, you don't have to spend a lot to make a difference. We're just proving that point there. Um, and obviously you can see from some of the photos that are here and photos that you've seen earlier, it just makes such a huge difference to the people that, that we support. And that goes for all charities. Um, you know, it, it makes people smile. It makes a difference to families you know, what, whatever charity you support, you're doing an amazing thing. Um, and although I am here representing Grace House, um, obviously, if you want advice on how to donate to charities, go to CC and Phil and they'll give you impartial advice. We're not forcing Grace House on you at all. Um, it's just a, <laughs> just an example. Um, so, so yes, so that's just some of the figures there going right up to, you know, £10,000 could pay for counselling sessions for a year and that family might need that year's support so um and which could make a difference to their family um so next slide Cece. yep so just again highlighting um sort of the difference that charities make um this is some some feedback that we've had um and we always love seeing feedback and sharing how we've made people feel um, and it is lovely to know that you know even during lockdown we're still making a difference to families even though we are such a hands-on service um, we've managed to adapt and change that and that is due to people's support you know we've had a lot of support since COVID-19 and it's just been amazing um, so yes and I think yeah when uh, the one on the right that says it's a lifeline i just think that's that's incredible so if that service isn't there anymore our families are going to really suffer for it so keeping that 
service going is um, is what we need to do. And I think the last slide is just my contact detail. Oh yes, um, again, just to highlight anyone who has supported Grace House. I know there's a few people in the um, in the webinar today that have supported us. So from everyone here, thank you so much. To everyone else, just thank you for listening um, and your help in making children smile like that. And I think that's the, the key takeaway um, from this. So so thank you all very much. You're so cute. And there it is. That's me with us uh, having a selfie with a, a pony who's dressed up as a reindeer um, because have. fundraising is fun <laughs> um, and I do have the best job. So um, yes, so my contact details are there. If anyone has um, any questions that they think of later on, please do connect with me um, and we can chat more about Grace House. So thank you so much, Laura. Um, and I just want to echo what what Laura said, and I think I could speak for Phil too, and I just say thank you so much um, for being here, uh, for listening and supporting us. Uh, this like this is recorded, so we will um, share it around and like post it on our social media and stuff. Uh, we're gonna do a Q&A in a second, so any questions that you ask in the Q&A will be cut out, um, so no like personal information will be shared or anything like that. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, we really appreciate you being here. I have been so excited for this. <laughs> we were all emailing each other earlier, like, yes, today. So <laughs> thank you so much uh, for helping us put this on. And we're going to uh, open up to questions now.